Happy midweek, everybody. We made it to Wednesday. It's August the 19th, and these are some of the headlines on BizarreBist.com. Florida Keys to Unleash Lab Bugs to Fight Diseased Mosquitoes. Minnesota Dem Racist Running for State House is for burning down the town. ISU professor threatens to dismiss students who oppose BLM and abortion. And here's what happened when kids went to school during the 1918 pandemic. All of these headlines and many more on BizarreBest.com. BizarreBest.com. Real news. No bullshit. Well, the Florida Keys is set to release genetically modified mosquitoes. I don't know if that's good for our ecosystem, but they seem to think it's just fine. Has science found a way to cut down on mosquito-borne diseases? Or will life find a way to break free from human meddling like Jurassic Park? That's the question hanging over a recent decision by state regulators in Florida, which would allow the biotech company Oxitec to unleash hundreds of millions of genetically modified male mosquitoes in the Florida Keys. Sounds like a disaster waiting to happen, y'all. The lab altered patented insects are members of um, a specific mosquito group, the species of mosquito that spreads diseases such as yellow fever, malaria, and other diseases. However, they have been genetically altered to artificially reduce future mosquito populations. It sounds a bit like mad science, but it's all about love, actually. The plan is to unleash millions of genetically modified males so they can hook up with all the lady mosquitoes and produce artificially weak offspring that never grow up, thereby reducing the overall population. So birds are going to die and bats. What about the, the animals that thrive in that ecosystem that eat those mosquitoes? It isn't all about humans, people. <sighs> Male mosquitoes don't drink human blood, so the influx of flying fellows theoretically wouldn't add to the problem. Advocates say it's a new population control strategy that could save millions of human lives around the world while getting rid of some annoying and dangerous bloodsuckers, so let's try it in the Keys and see what happens. All the freaking birds are going to starve to death because guess what? Birds fly south or warmer climates for winter. I don't know, dude. Mosquitoes are among the deadliest animals in the world, according to the WHO, which has attributed 438,000 deaths to insects through malaria alone in 2015. Critics have described it as a risky experiment with too many unknown factors, especially when it comes to introducing genetically modified creatures into a natural ecosystem. Why don't you try it in an enclosed environment first and see what happens. I mean, not just in the lab. You could create a uh, mini ecosystem and it'll tell you what's going to happen. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency gave Oxitec permission last month to run a pilot project with its lab designed mosquitoes until 2022. The Florida granted the company an experimental use permit this week. The decisions to move Oxitec one step closer to releasing its insects into the world even in the face of lawsuit threats. But don't worry, the lab-grown mosquitoes are friendly. They've even trademarked the name Oxitex Friendly. Dude, it sounds like a bunch of bullshit to me. They pose no risk to human health or environment, including fish and other aquatic life, birds, bats, plants, and birds, and except for there's no food. Fish eat mosquitoes too. Oxitec CEO, uh, this dude named Gray, also applauded the state's decision. There's a broad consensus among public health officials in the U.S. that a new generation of safe, targeted, and cost-effective vector control tools. Why isn't this being voted on by the people, not just permission given by the state? I think that they should be voting on this. This is a public health situation that actual people should be voting on, in my opinion. I don't think the EPA has shit to do with it. If they're going to approve it, they should run it through the voting process so that people have to approve it as well. Several environmental anti-GMO groups have announced their intent to sue in the hope of preventing the insect's release. 
They claim the company has exaggerated the impact of past trials, including t a test in Brazil. The plan is a Jurassic Park experiment, says uh, a critic from The Guardian, or a critic that told The Guardian that. That's where that original story came from. Hansen has been fighting the mosquitoes, releases policy director for the International Center for Technology Assessment and Center for Food Safety. What could possibly go wrong? We don't know because they unlawfully refuse to seriously analyze environmental risks. Opponents in the experiment rallied outside the Florida Keys Mosquito Controlled Federal Office on Tuesday where they accused the government of treating them like guinea pigs. Exactly. Take that shit back, y'all. Oxitec is one of the several groups experimenting with genetically modified mosquitoes through a patent process. They're going to kill us all eventually. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has also worked with Oxitex. Well, there you go. <laughs> known, and they're developing something known as Gene Drive, a genetic modification meant to spread through multiple generations of mosquitoes to leave them sterile. That's exactly what they're trying to do to people too, dude. So what happens if, okay, so males don't bite. But what if they are eaten by another animal? And then it just spreads the sterile from there. Like, who knows? Uh, Oxitex has also been eyeing Houston for its mosquito testing beginning next year. Watch out, y'all. I'm telling you. It's unclear when Oxi the Oxitec experiment in Florida will begin, given the remaining legal challenges ahead of it. Well, good. Y'all better get off your tufts and fight that shit, because something's going to go wrong. It just doesn't even sound right, man. Let the world animal population handle itself humans have no business in that um, except for white northern rhinos trying to increase that population because we destroy them so yeah there's that i'm gonna link it at bizarrebus.com oh. fair warning this video contains explicit language so please don't have any small children around when you're listening to it minnesota democrat running for state house asked crowd if we give a fuck about burning town down um, cause he's clearly, um, <laughs> not in his right mind. A Democrat running for state house in Minnesota asked a crowd if we give a fuck about burning down a town during a Black Lives Matter rally on Friday. John Thompson's campaign has been supported by the Minnesota governor, Tim Waltz, and Minnesota's Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Apparently, those two who are supporting him are also racist and crazy. On Friday, Thompson attended a rally outside the home of uh, Minneapolis Police Chief Union President Bob Kroll in Hugo, Minnesota, where he delivered a 10-minute speech laden with profanities and violent rhetoric. His remarks were captured by reporters. And I don't understand how it's okay for you to do that without a permit, number one. But number two, you're outside somebody's home, dude. That's where their fucking family lives. If, if I was this guy, I'd sue the shit out of you. We're coming. We're coming for everything that you motherfuckers took from us. We're coming for them congressional seats. We're coming for the money you owe us. This whole goddamn state burned down for $20.00. You think we give a fuck about burning Hugo down? Where he's at? The, the town where he's at? He is pro violence, dude. And BLM won't denounce any of this shit because they are a domestic terror organization, which is also racist. Thompson's mention of the $20 is likely a reference to the counterfeit 20 that. George Floyd allegedly attempt to pass in Minneapolis. <laughs> he did. It's not allegedly, dude. Either way, his murder wasn't right, but I'm saying. He also spoke directly to residents of Kroll's neighborhood who took on the rally from their driveway, who looked on to, at the rally from their driveways. Y'all got a grand wizard living in your goddamn neighborhood, he told one family. Fuck your motherfucking peace. White racist motherfuckers, he said. So fuck peace, you're white racist motherfuckers. Take that sign and stick it up your ass, he yelled at another neighborhood resident who held an American flag with a blue stripe designed to show support for the police. Thompson can also be seen yelling at a group of teenage girls in a video recorded and posted 
on Twitter. There's several videos on here. You ain't never seen a legislator like this before, he added at one point during his, his remarks, shortly before a woman wearing a red cross made from a tape, made from tape, wafted him with smoke from what appears to be a bundle of sage. <laughs> she came out of nowhere <laughs> with the sage, y'all, <laughs> trying to cleanse his negativity. <laughs> Thompson was joined roughly by a hundred other protesters outside Chief's home. The protesters arrived in the Hugo neighborhood in an organized caravan of vehicles as organizers blocked traffic. So you're screaming at a in, in a neighborhood with a hundred other assholes outside of some dude's home bitching at his neighbors and calling everybody a racist. Sounds like you're the problem, <laughs> not the solution. Anyway, I'm going to link it and you can see the videos for yourself. Y'all need to seriously figure out your team, okay? Because I don't give a shit what color you are. If you are for violence and this kind of action, then you are pushing the clock closer uh, to midnight on the Civil War front. I'm going to link it. At Bizarre Best An Iowa State University professor reportedly threatens to dismiss a students or set of students who oppose abortion or Black Lives Matter movement or a lot of other shit. An Iowa State University English professor reportedly threatened to dismiss students from her class if they oppose abortion or Black Lives Matter movement or any instances of othering that you participate in intentionally, including racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, sorophobia, transphobia, classism, mocking of mental health issues, body shaming in class or grounds for dismissal from the classroom. The same goes for any papers projects. You cannot choose any topic that takes it at its base that one side doesn't deserve the same basic human rights as you do i.e. no arguments against gay marriage, abortion, Black Lives Matter, etc. I take this seriously uh, from Chloe Clark, professor wrote in her fall syllabus, which was obtained by the Young America's Foundation through an anonymous source. Clark graduated from Iowa State in 2016 and now teaches in the school's English department according to YAF. This is just the latest instance of leftists corrupting, corrupting the practice of higher education. Actually, she's probably just sick of reading about it. Reading the arguments, it's the hot topic of today and she's probably fed up with it. It sounds like she's not putting up with any, uh, not just Black Lives Matter, she probably would say the same thing if you were pro-police too, she's sick of it. Universities across the country have developed plans in recent months to address racism and inequality following the death, the murder of George Floyd. They always say the death, I say the murder. Earlier this summer, um, uh, Rutgers University English Department announced that it would alter its grammar standards to stand with and respond to the Black Lives Matter movement. See, to me, that's not right. None of this belongs in school. Um, you're there to learn and uh, not necessarily about that. <laughs> this approach challenges the familiar dogma that writing instruction should limit emphasis on grammar. Um, it's just, to me, um, none of this belongs in school. While I could understand that, that someone might write about that, um, I think if you say you're going to dismiss students who oppose abortion or Black Lives Matter specifically, uh, that's calling somebody out. And that seems a little racist to me also. But having said that includes or any form of racism, sexism, ableism, etc. I think that she covered her ass there pretty well, but I do understand the concern. Um, anyway, you can make up your own mind. I'll link it at bizarrebus.com. Let's take a quick break, and uh, we wanted to show you the support page at bizarrebus.com, where you can just go to bizarrebus.com and click on support us. You can choose t-shirts. Uh, anything you've seen in the videos, we try to list 
There's five uh, different ways that you can try to support us. You can use Cash App, Zelle, PayPal, Bitcoin. Um, you can just send a straight uh, Zelle request if you want, Venmo. You can uh, choose to uh, purchase a mask, any of the t-shirts. We got Alien Lives Matter, Earth Life Matters, Black Hole Eats Matters, Black Holes Eat Matter. Um, <laughs> we've got a lot of different things you can do to support us. We would certainly appreciate it if you feel that we deserve that. Thank you so much. Dude, it's Bizarre Best Headlines, 100% unfiltered. So here's what happened when students went to school during the 1918 pandemic. This isn't the first time leaders have struggled with deciding whether to keep schools open in a pandemic. During the influenza pandemic of 1918, even though the world was a very different place, the discussion was just as heated. The pandemic killed an estimated 50 million people worldwide, including 675,000 Americans, before it was all over. While the vast majority of cities closed their schools, three opted to keep them open. New York, Chicago, and New Haven. Connecticut. The decisions of health officials in those cities was based largely on the hypothesis of public health officials that students were safer and better off at school. It was, after all, the height of the progressive era, with its emphasis on hygiene in schools and more nurses for each student than is thinkable now. New York had almost one million school children in 1918, and about 75% of them lived in tenements in crowded, often unsanitary conditions, according to a 2010 article uh, in the Public Health Reporters, the official journal for the U.S. Surgeon General and the U.S. Public Health Service. For students from the tenement districts, school offered a clean, well-ventilated environment where teachers, nurses, and doctors already practiced and documented thorough routine medical inspections. According to the Public Health Reports article, the city was one of the hardest and earliest hit by the flu, said Dr. Howard Markle, a medical historian. Um, he is from the Center for the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan. Um, children leave their often unsanitary homes for large, clean, airy school buildings where there is always a system of inspection and examination enforced. I don't think that's the case now. New York Health Commissioner at the time, Dr. Royal Copeland, told the New York Times after the pandemic had peaked there. Students weren't allowed to gather outside the school and had to report to their teacher immediately. According to Copeland, teachers checked students for any signs of flu and students who had symptoms were isolated. If students had a fever, someone from the health department would take them home and the health official would judge whether conditions were suitable for isolation and care. According to public health reports, if not, they were sent to a hospital, which wouldn't happen today. Um, the health department required families of the children recovering at home to either have a family physician or the use of services of a public health doctor, doctor at no charge. The argument in Chicago for leaving school open, open for its 500,000 students was the same. Keeping schools open would keep the children off the streets and away from infected adults. If social distancing was helpful then, it would have been made easier by the fact that absenteeism in schools soared during the pandemic, perhaps because of what one Chicago public health official called flu-phobia among parents. The absentee rate was so great, it didn't. It really didn't matter that schools were open. Part of Chicago's strategy was to ensure that fresh air was circulated. School rooms were overheated during the winter so that windows could remain open at all times. That wouldn't happen now. The paper concluded that an analysis of data showed that the decision of keeping the schools of the city open during the recent influenza epidemic was justified. In New York, the uh, health commissioner Copeland told New York Times how much better it had been to have the children under the constant observation of qualified persons than to close the schools. I think parents are qualified people, dude. Markle, who was with other researchers, poured over the data and historical records and looking at res the response for 43 cities. 
uh, to the 1918 pandemic, and it isn't as convinced. New York didn't do the worst, but it didn't do the best either. Markle said adding Chicago was slightly better. Research showed that cities who implemented quarantining and isolation, school closures, and bans on public gatherings fared the best. The cities that did more than one of these measures did better. School closures were part of that contribution. Public health experts, including Markle, are quick to point out that COVID is not an influenza. It's a totally different situation, which was a well-known disease in 1918 flu was. There is still a lot to learn about this virus and the disease it causes. The right decision today, he said, is school closure. It's better to be safe than sorry, and I would have to agree with that. Um, in any event, I will link this at Bizarre Abyss. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Stay bizarre. Yeah. Hey. Make sure you take a deep breath. Think positive. Just saying. Dude. Penguins given free reign to roam around the aquarium since there's no visitors allowed. That's awesome. Dude, look. He's looking around. He's loving it. I got a new section under the on the headlines page at the bottom called Bad Seeds. Matt Geats of Florida, 1st Congressional District, blocked the whole process by wearing a gas mask when reviewing the funding. You're a super freaking winner, dude. An Alaska airman has been punished for peeing in the office coffee maker. Dude, why? Like, how did, why? Did you take it in the bathroom with you? Did you stand in the kitchen and whip it out? Clearly, this airman is dedicated to getting kicked the F out. He's trying really hard, y'all.